Street Knowledge with Chris Graham. Welcome to the podcast. It's uh, Monday, and I'm Chris Graham, and I'm joined by Jerry Carter. And Jerry and I are going to we're going to talk some issues here in sports, kind of recap the weekend, maybe get you ready for the week ahead in the sports world. And and uh, so, Jerry, uh, first off, I guess uh, how 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 was your sports weekend? How was your weekend in general? How are things going for you? Well, Christy, uh, my time here in Vegas is winding down. In fact, uh, two weeks from today when we talk, I will be back on my little island in my little corner of the world. But uh, it's been a fun week, fun weekend as well. And there was quite a few little uh, anecdotes that uh, were sitting out there in the sports world. Of course, you always want to sneak in the fact that he did, he did fumble the ball twice. He did fumble the ball twice. But Daniel Jones had another nice outing. He went 11 for 14, threw threw a touchdown pass. And uh, so I'm real happy about that. But, Chris, my quote, uh, the quote of the week for me came from that in the fact that uh, Mara, the Giants owner, was asked a question, what would be a good week? Uh, I'm sorry, a good season. And he answered, he said, a good season for me would be if Eli plays every down and Daniel Jones never sees the field. And uh, I'm sure you saw that quote at some point, but ask the coach about it. And they said, coach, are you on the same page? Coach says, last time I checked, he owns the team. So, of course, I'm on the same page. I thought that was uh, Uh was kind of a classic answer. But the the first one I wanted to ask you about um, came from uh, Mr. Boone, the manager of the Yankees. And do you see where he shared his thoughts on the concept of Major League Baseball adding a football? Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, my thought would be, I mean, mean, at first thought, it's like, well, you know, there's 150 years of Major League president that says no we can't do that that's crazy why would you do something like that but you know we've had a lot of games like uh this year where a mercy rule could have had an impact and here's here's why it's worth more exploration in those games you know i mean you know for fans out there when you watch a game your your favorite teams play most games you play are close games they're within a run or two you know six seventh inning at least it's it's a it's a relatively close game You've got your A bullpen and your B bullpen, whether whether whatever your team calls them. You know your A bullpen is your setup, your setup men for the seventh and eighth innings, your closer in the ninth. You know you've got your routine down. That's how you think you can win a game. Your B bullpen is guys that I mean they're in the major leagues, they got talent, they got skill, but they're not the guys that you put in the game necessarily when it's it's a, a close game. There are guys who eat innings up when you're behind. Say you're behind five nothing in the sixth inning. You know you don't you don't trot your seventh and eighth inning guys out and your closer out. You you put different guys in the game. So what happens in a eleven nothing game in the fifth inning or sixth inning is okay. You've you've got those guys, uh, and then more and more you're seeing this year, uh, even with uh, managers having much deeper pitching staffs than we used to have. I mean back in the '80s. You know, you'd only carry nine pitchers, eight or nine pitchers, maybe ten. Ten was revolutionary when, got, when when teams would carry ten pitchers back in the 80s. You had that many more bench guys for your re- regular everyday player positions. And now you're talking 13, maybe 14 guys, uh, depending on a situation in your bullpen, uh, your starting staff in your bullpen. So, But even then, you, you still don't want to eat innings up when you're down in a game where you're hopelessly out of it. So you're seeing position players used. Well, the, the problem there is, I mean, you know, re- remember Jose Canseco 20-some years ago got hurt, uh, you know, throwing, finishing out a game, uh, hurt, his, hurt his elbow, missed, missed a season. Uh, I, have, I don't know that anybody's gotten hurt this year, but it's just it's, it's not competitive. It's not good entertainment. It's just stringing out the game. And um, so I can see it, you know. I mean, if it's a, if it's a game that's out of reach, I can see it. it it's, it's played that way. At the college level on Sunday games in conference play, uh, certainly people in high school are used to it. So I can see it uh, because, again, when a game is out of reach, uh, you're just kind of playing through the motions and you're putting guys out there in positions they shouldn't be in. You know, I, I can definitely see that there's merit to more discussion of that, Jerry. Well, Chris, I, I brings up, uh, your response brings up a twofold question. I mean, one of the things that Boone uh, mentioned is talking about where 
the ego is concerned, and that nobody likes getting embarrassed. And talking about some of the uh, problems they have on the field with beanings and, uh, and fights, he actually thinks that having that rule might slow that down. And so if your thoughts on that, and then the second half of it is in regards to the fan. The fan who bought the baseball ticket, thinking he's coming to see a nine-inning game, do you putting yourself in the fan seat? Or we talk about how much you enjoy watching the Nats play. If you were as a fan in the seats, and the game gets called in the sixth inning for a slaughter rule, are you okay with that? So whichever one of those two you want to take first. I'll take that second one first because the Nats had a laugh for just yesterday. Uh, they had a 13 nothing lead in the fourth inning. Uh, it might have been the third inning. I think it was actually after three innings. It might have been 13 nothing. Yeah, because they had four in the first, two in the second, seven in the third. So it was 13 nothing after three. I'll be honest. I didn't pay close attention after the third inning. You know, the final score was 16-8. to eight. Uh, The uh, Brewers scored four in the ninth to make it look a, look a little more respectable. But, man, that game was over about an hour in, and it's fun. I mean, as a Nats fan, I was glad it was over. After about an hour, you know, they had lost a game the night before in 14 innings and it was kind of a gut wrenching loss. And then for them to come out and, and take control and, and make it make it, uh, you know, pretty much a laugher early was nice. But no, I didn't watch. And I'll think back to a game I went to in Baltimore a few years ago. We went we went uh, for a weekend in Baltimore uh, the when the O's were still very competitive uh, and they were playing the A's. We went to a Saturday night game. That was one on a walk-off home in the bottom of the ninth. And then on Sunday, it was sort of similar to yesterday's Nats game. It might have been, you know, it was, I think it was 17-2 to two in the fifth inning. We got in the car and left. You know, it was, it was, uh, uh, it was, you know, Sunday afternoon. We'd been there for, you know, for a while. It was a hot Sunday afternoon. So we just, we just got in the car and left. And, and so, you know, no, I don't. I, I don't know that you stay around for nine innings of a game like that. I mean, if your team's getting beat that bad, you're not staying. And if you're winning by that much, you know, you're 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 getting you know tachos, you're getting a hot dog, whatever else. But then you're probably getting on the road, especially on a Sunday game. So, so no. The other part of that, you know, you ask about you know whether or not it could help stop stop fights and that kind of thing. I mean. That's a different issue, maybe. I mean, the, the thing about guys getting embarrassed, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm still – these unwritten baseball rules where, you know, you're not supposed to bunt when you're up big. You're not supposed to uh, steal. I mean, what's the, so what they're already conceding is the game's over. If you're not supposed to play the game, you're conceding the game is over. Um, I'm, I'm not so worried about the embarrassment part as the competitive part. Uh, and so – uh, I think it merits more discussion. I'm not sure that baseball would go that route, but you know, another area where it would, would fix things would be that game yesterday, the, the 16-8 Nats game. It, it, you know, it was over about an hour in, but the game started at 1:30 and it didn't finally finish until about five or so. So for those fans who did stay behind, that was a three and a half hour baseball game. You know, if they, if if that game had been called after seven innings, you know, there's another 45 minutes to an hour we get back. Uh, in terms of average length of game. So, uh, you know, I, I, I think people want to see more competitive baseball, not necessarily just more baseball. So I think it would it would solve a problem there too. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. And, and again, I'm, I'm not going to put Boone in the same category of, of Steve Kerr, who I have a ton of respect for. But I like Boone bringing it up, trying to think outside of the box, because I do think one of the biggest issues that Major League Baseball faces is the time of the game. And it's one thing when you're seeing a pitcher's duel or a slug test and evenly balanced or extra inning game for a game to be four hours and you're on the edge of your seat for the whole four hours. Four hours doesn't seem that long. But when you're on the you're on the wrong end of it, either way, whether it's a, a lopsided game or if it's being played in a manner to where that one side is another word for lop, uh, you know, for lopsided. Uh, a great example for me the other day, again, obviously my favorite baseball team outside of the Mariners is whoever Marcus Strom is pitching for. Strom is pitching uh, against the Braves the other night, and he walks off the mound. Uh, when he comes out of the game, he's got a 10 to 3 lead. I immediately stop watching the game. Lynn goes, what, What's up? I said, Well, 
I said, the only way he doesn't get the win now is if the bullpen just throws up on itself. And I don't pay any more attention to it. 90 minutes later, the game ends 10-8, and they had the top run on base. I put back to that question of if you were going to do it, what would the number have to be? What would what would the number have to be? How many runs after how at what point? But I, I absolutely agree with you about the concept of if you're not trying to bunt and you're not trying to steal, you're trying to play less than full out. I, I think that's an issue as well. So yeah. I, I, I would I would I would let me add into there because there was a there was an instance yesterday's game in the eighth inning. Nats are up sixteen four, and I think it was. I don't think it wasn't Para, but it may have been Harara. In fact, it was Harara Para. Uh, runner on first uh, and one out, and he hit a ground ball. Um, he clearly didn't run that ground ball out very hard. And normally, you don't run a ground ball out hard to get, you know, negative attention in baseball. But everybody knew why he didn't run that ground ball out hard because it turned into a double play, and hey, that got us out quicker. Um, but to your point, Jerry, about length of game, the night before, so I, I mentioned the 14 inning baseball game. It was, I mean, I, I'm a purist, so I like two to one and three to two games more than I like high scoring games generally. But people out here listening might remember, you might have at least seen the score. The Nats lost 15 14 in 14 innings on Saturday night. And I tell you, from, from a standpoint of baseball purity, it was ugly. I mean, it was, it, you know, the Nats blew a save, the, the Brewers blew a save, you know, they went back and forth in extra innings for a while. Game went five hours and 45 minutes. It was riveting. I, that was a great baseball game. The Nats lost. It was gut-wrenching. I was up a lot later than I thought it would be on a Saturday night watching baseball, but it was fun. And uh, for five hours, 45 minutes, I couldn't stop watching that game. Now, you know, again, on Sunday, only three and a half hours, but two and a half hours of that was superfluous. It was gratuitous. And uh, so... You know, uh, you know, it, it, it's it's it is what it is. I'm not one who worries so much about the average length of game. Football games are three three to three and a half hours. You know, and baseball games are right in that same range. It's about though the excitement level. And uh, you know, if we can maintain excitement level, I'll watch a baseball game all night and, and enter tomorrow morning. But uh, and, and I've been known to do that. There was a UVA baseball game when they were on their way to the College World Series championship in 2015. Uh, the, uh, the they were in the regional round playing uh, Southern California out at USC. Game started about 11:30 our time, 8:30 their time. Didn't end. Literally, the sun was coming up, Jerry. That game went 14 or 15 innings as well. UVA won, won the regional championship, got to host a super regional. But literally, the sun's coming up, and I'm still watching baseball. But I loved every second of it. So length of game, not so much a thing. Excitement level, yes. And I think Aaron Boone's uh, point here is worth a lot more talk, and I'd love to see them address this seriously in the offseason. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that completely. I, cause on the base, we had a couple other baseball notes real quick, and I'm not sure how familiar you were uh, with this thought process, but growing up, I'd always heard, I, I used to follow baseball, I'm not going to say religiously, but a lot more seriously. And it was something to where we were always told that when a player gets to Triple uh, A, whether it's a pitcher or a hitter, that their stats are going to be heavily influenced on which league they're playing in. And you know, of course, there's three. And I never really understood why, but I can fully appreciate it now, being out here, <laughs> Vegas, and watching a lot of Pacific Coast uh, baseball games. Yes, the stadium. The here, which is the brand new one they built, it's the most modern stadium in our country right now. Just opened the doors recently. It sits at 2,300 feet in the air. Yeah. And we're sitting here, uh, Josh and uh, my son in law and Sabrina and the baby were out here last week. So I took Josh out to the stadium. And I said, okay, here's what you don't get in the Pacific Coast League pitching duels. It, does, it doesn't happen. If somebody puts the bat on the ball, it's it's rocketing somewhere. And I've been out there uh, going out again tonight. It'll be, I think, my eighth time out this summer. Highly entertaining. And it's, it's hilarious when you see the pitcher's ERAs. Yeah, yeah. And that, that, that particular night, um, the Aviators, the home team, won it in a walk-off 
uh, bottom of the ninth, three-run rally to win the game 10 to nothing. And it got me, you know, paying more and more attention to this Fox board out here. Then you start thinking about all the places where the elevation are concerned. And it's not just Las Vegas that sits at a, uh, at a high elevation. And people talk about it when it comes to playing football and basketball games at a much greater pace. You know, a team takes a trip out to certain parts of whether they're going to Wyoming or Colorado, but it really does have a, a pretty incredible influence on a baseball game as well. Yeah. So now on the baseball, the, uh, the other baseball note there, and you and I talked a little bit um, a week or two ago about how cool it was with what they were doing with the Field of Dreams game and how hard it would be to get a ticket to that game where they're only having 8,000 seats. Of course, I don't know if you saw any of the game on Sunday. Uh, I was on the East Coast for a day earlier this summer to uh, pick up my grandson for his first visit out to see us, and I made a point to go to Williamsport. And it was a situation to where I went both to the Little League field and the minor league field. And they play uh, in the New York Penn League, uh, which Class A ball, because they played that game last night in a stadium. They played that game last night in a stadium that seats 2,600. Uh-huh. And the first batch of the tickets went to all the Little League teams. Yes. So I had to think in my head, I'm going, that has to be arguably the hardest ticket you could ever try to get to in. Um, a major league baseball game. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know how, who would have who would have had access to them, or or maybe what they might have sold for. But again, the same way that we did a couple of weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about baseball going back to its roots, that was just another. Another great example of, of doing that, yeah. and I didn't know what your thoughts were on seeing them play, not only in a in a minor league stadium, but arguably one of the smallest in the country. Yeah, I, I didn't watch the game closely. I did have it on TV for for a couple different times last night. Um, uh, I loved the fact that the and, and not only did you know the little league teams get the first dibs at tickets, but they sat in great seats right behind home plate, and they were very visible. They were wearing their colorful uniforms, sitting right behind home plate. You could hear the kids chattering. It was awesome. Uh, that might have been the loudest crowd. I mean, ESPN might have had, the, and I assume had the stadium mic'd pretty well, but man, those kids were into that game. That was the biggest thing, and plus the way they did it where, you know, the kids got to, to, to like kind of escort the players off the bus and you know, all that kind of stuff. I think Chris Archer was sitting out there with them, interviewing them during different, different parts of the game. That was awesome. Uh, I will say that your your our conversation about Field of Dreams, uh, my wife is out of town. She's actually in your part of the world right now, Vegas, getting ready to fly back from a, from a weekend trip. And uh, so I was, kind of, I was kind of a bachelor for a weekend. Well, I watched Field of Dreams on Sunday, or excuse me, on Saturday. Uh, and uh, I broke a record. It usually takes me about 20 minutes to start blubbering through the movie. About five minutes in already, when they played the first strands of that emotional music, I'm starting to already say, okay, I know where this is going. I might as well just start tearing up now. And uh, I was sobbing uncontrollably. It always gets me, Jerry, that scene at the end when uh, Shoeless Joe uh, is walking off the field. They're taking Terrence Mann back into the, uh, the, the corn, and then uh, – Ray Kinsella's dad, John, is there, and they have a catch. Boy, even just now saying it that way uh, gets me all worked up. Uh, what a movie, and it got me It got me again. It got me again. And uh, uh, so if, if I wasn't already – if my heart wasn't already in baseball, it's even more so now. Yeah, it, uh, I have to believe that it, it, it makes my list of the best sports movie ever made. Uh, or, you know, my favorite. I, I, that way it's easier to say that because, you know, for every person who loves Field of Dreams, there's somebody else that will, will talk, uh, you know, Bull Durham to you. But it does a great job of capturing so many things. And uh, it's uh, it's an easy watch. It's a fun watch. And as you, as you just said so well, it's an emotional watch. 
Uh, before we get off the baseball format, a couple notes here. First one, the Yankees now have clinched their 27th consecutive winning season. And uh, I know there's a lot of people that don't like the way the Yankees do business or maybe didn't much when uh, Dad owned the team versus versus. It's, but what's your thought process on lacing them up and having 27 consecutive of having a winning record? Well, as much money as they spend, they better have winning records. And, of course, the, the, way, the way the folks there think, uh, they, they don't just go for the winning record. You know, we don't play baseball to just have a winning record, and they haven't won a series in a while. Um, the, the Red Sox have won a few recently, and uh, the Red Sox have the number now. But it is, it is the longevity is interesting. That dates back to 1993. And I think what's more interesting even than that, the 27 straight, is the struggles between, say, 81. Because the 81 team, that strike shortened season, went to a series, lost to the Dodgers. Uh, that was the tail end of a run where you know, that Reggie Jackson-fueled team had won two straight back in 77 and 78. Just missed the playoffs in 79. Made the playoffs in 80. Didn't get to the World Series. 81, they get to the World Series. And then from 81 all the way to, what was it, I guess 96. Didn't go to a series, only went to the playoffs a couple of times. Uh, you, you know, in New, it, it, I, I can't imagine now. I mean, I remember I was a, I was, I've been a baseball fan all my life, not a Yankees fan, but I can only imagine how those 15 years <laughs> were so hard for Yankees fans, uh, because now you hear Yankees fans. I, I, what's interesting about Yankees fans? You know, you'll you'll talk to a Yankees fan who's 30 years old, and they'll talk about how we've won 27 World Series or whatever that number is. Well. Okay, honestly, most of those were uh, in the Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, uh, Joe DiMaggio, Mickey Mantle era. You weren't alive then. You weren't a glint in the eye. Uh, your your parents weren't glints in the eyes of your grandparents when all that happened. So the we part we can kind of get away from. But yeah, they're they're they're. I mean, they are. It's Gotham's best. Uh, and uh, what I like about the the more recent incarnation of the Yankees, I guess. You know, when, when Steinbrenner built built the team back up in the 90s, it was because Steinbrenner said, look, I, or he, he said or somebody said to him, uh, stop stop signing all the free agents. Let us build from within. And they built from within. And, uh, you know, Rivera came through the system and Jeter. And, uh, you know, there was a number of guys uh, that, that they, they kind of they grew they grew the homegrown went the homegrown route. Uh, you know, as that group aged, they tried to – Posada was another. They, uh, uh, Bernie Williams, they all came up through the, the minor league system. They tried to replenish with free agents towards the end. That's when it fell off. Now we're seeing it again. You know, there was a little period in between. Uh, now we're seeing it again where the Yankees are building from within. They're, they're, they're kind of fleshing things out on the sides here and there with, with free agent signings. But – you know, even even the Yankees have to do it the right way. You've got to build from within, and and, and so I like seeing that. Uh, you know, I, I don't like it when uh, you know teams just spend as much money as they can and win. Um, spend money the right way, build from within, and that's what they're doing, and that's why they're back to where they are. Yeah, it's you know I know it's different sports, and it's one of those things about uh, comparing apples to oranges. But because one of those streaks just ended last year. How would you compare 27 straight years of a winning baseball record to Florida State or you could say Virginia Tech with their full streak? Yeah. Again, apples to oranges, but what, what's your thought process on having that level of success over that length of a period of time? Yeah, it, it is very different. College football – uh, once you build a program, you kind of have to work hard to screw it up. And uh, and unfortunately, in both cases of Florida State and Virginia Tech, uh, some, thing, some decisions were made, I guess, with, with coaches that kind of let things get screwed up. Uh, because once you build a system and put it in place, I mean, you, you don't have to worry about a draft. There's no draft. In, now, baseball's draft is not – that doesn't have the same impact the NFL draft or the, or, or the NBA draft have. But – it's, there's still an impact. I mean, you still, you know, in, in baseball, again, it's best to build from within. So, you know, if you if you do things right, but it takes a while for that to mature. And in in college football, in college basketball, you know, if you're if you're Duke or Kentucky in basketball, if you're if, until recent the last couple of years, Florida State, Virginia Tech, certainly Alabama, you know, lots of schools, Notre Dame, LSU, you don't have to worry about 
restrictions on your ability to, to acquire talent. You can sign in, in college football. You can sign 25 five-star players if you want to this year. Um, they might take a year or two to mature and, and contribute on the field, but if you sign 25 of them last year, they'll be in, in 25 two years ago, 25 three years ago. I mean, you can kind of see how that goes. In in pro sports, you can't stockpile talent quite as easily as you can in college sports if if you're one of those wealthy elites, if you want to call them that. They're not necessarily more wealthy. They just they have they have recruiting advantages. They have you know all those advantages. So, to me, in professional sports, to have the run the Yankees have had, and and, and I would say in the NFL, what the New England Patriots have done over the last almost 20 years, uh, with that Tom Brady, Bill Belichick pairing, uh, that's so hard. Uh, so many things have to happen right in pro sports for you to have that run of longevity. In college sports, if you build if you build it, he will come. To use the the field of dreams reference, if you build the system, you've got to work really hard to screw it up. And unfortunately for Virginia Tech and Florida State football fans, uh, that's happened. But no, I, I so I think the Yankees run much more impressive. Okay, one last baseball note, and I, I felt good about having mentioned it last week. Um, I, I knew the young man a little bit when he was at Florida, but I want to say congratulations to Pete. Alonzo, who uh, now owns the National League home run record for a rookie when he hit his 40th home run. And, and kind of felt bad for Bellinger because I think Bellinger didn't get to have that record a whole long time. And I didn't know if you've had enough chance to see Alonzo or know, know very much about him, but what kind of you're, you're setting the precedent when you come out your rookie year. And not only is he hit 40, it's still August. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be really interesting to see what happened to that number before uh, before the season's over. Hey, let me throw a couple of baseball notes in too. Alonzo, I, the only I, he he was uh, he hit well against the Nats in a series. The Mets and the Nats had a great series two weekends ago. A um, couple of UVA baseball notes. Uh, Adam Hazley was sent down last week by the Phillies uh, as Jay Bruce came back healthy. Hazley was hitting 255, but he'd been on a hot streak, and they're going to call him back up in September, it, it, it appears. Uh, he'll be part of the stretch run for the Phillies. Uh, Matt Theis, a, a, a 2016 first-round pick, has um, kind of solidified himself at the major league level. Hazley was a 2017 first-round pick, uh, and he was the first, uh, excuse me, second member of that first-round class in 2017 to make the major leagues. Theis uh, was 3-4 for four with uh, a home run and four RBIs for the Angels in a 9-2 win uh, yesterday. And here, this is this is the best story. And I'm not even talking about a guy who's, who's made the big leagues yet. 2011, number two overall pick, Danny Hulson. Boy, he, if there was anybody destined for great success, picked by your Seattle Mariners out there out in the, in the Northwest, uh, had all kinds of arm issues, ended up, just retiring from baseball in 2016, he became a volunteer assistant coach at UVA. Um, and uh, he took some time off, uh, started throwing again, uh, all of a sudden was hitting mid-90s with his, on the gun with his fastball, uh, auditioned for a couple of teams. The, the Chicago Cubs signed him to a minor league deal last year, kind of you know used the kid gloves with him. Uh, he is at AAA right now in Iowa as a lefty reliever, uh, uh, 13 appearances, a 1.32 ERA, 22 strikeouts in 13 and two-thirds innings, a 0.78 walks and hits to innings pitched. Looks like the Cubs are going to call him up either either soon because they've got three guys on the DL on the IL, uh, including C uh, Craig Kimbrell from their bullpen. Brandon Kinsler is also on the IL. Uh, so he might be a quick call-up now, but certainly if not between now and September 1st, he'll be a September 1st roster call-up. Uh, and... The, the moment that Danny Holtzen makes his major league debut, if that's all he does, if all he ends up is moon, if he's moonlight Graham to once again reference Field of Dreams, and he just gets a couple innings this September, you know, no, that's not what was projected for him back in 2011 when he was the number two overall pick. But given what he's gone through, the multiple surgeries, retiring, coming back, working himself to where he is now, if he gets to pitch in a major league game, there will be tears streaming down my face for that young man and what he's had to endure to get there. Yeah, you have to you have to love the perseverance. And anytime those are always the kind of stories that I'm searching out is the people that you know, not only uh, have the talent but have the heart. And you know the the concept of, of 
yeah, having to step away from it and rebuilding, I do think it's a matter of time before he ends up uh, on the north side. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a fun day. It's going to be a fun day. And I really wish that, I hate to use the term, street media, but I hope that story gets the kind of love and attention that it should. And any, you know, we're, everybody wants to point out when something goes wrong or something bad happens. But that truly is a feel-good story. And the fact that it has a UVA tie to it is it's a close-to-home feel-good story. So I'm really, uh, really anxious to see that happen. Um, and we'll look forward to the day that he gets to come out there and, uh, and pitch for the first time. Hey, switching, <laughs> switching over from baseball, I had a couple here that just that jumped off the page at me. And I read, I read a lot and listen a lot. And I basically have, I have my, my Chris Graham meter running while I'm, while I'm reading. And I had something happen this week that really did jump off the page. Did you see the story, and I'm going to apologize, Chris, for not knowing the coach's name, uh, Louisiana's college football coach. Yeah, I don't have the name either, but I know the story you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So he comes out, and for those that are listening, he comes out and says, hey, I want my football team to support the booster club who supports us. Uh-huh. And that's a nice thought. It really is. And then he comes out and says, I want each one of them to pay uh, the fee to do so. Yeah. And you're sitting there and you're going, okay, I, you know, maybe this happens in other places. Maybe we just haven't heard about it. Um, it'll be kind of interesting to see how this, plays, how this plays out. And sure enough, it wasn't that long before somebody came back and says, hey, coach, you're making $875,000. If you paid the membership for each one of your players, you'd still make $830,000. And I, I, I wanted to see what your take was on that as that, as that story came about. Yeah, it's it, it just it, it's such a slap in the face of where things need to be in college athletics. I mean, you're just, it, it's it was a fifty dollar membership fee. There's roughly a hundred players on a team, including walk on. So you're talking about five thousand dollars out of his pocket if he wanted to pay it, which is fine. If he wanted to pay that for his guys, that'd be a really nice thing. Hey, I'm I'm donating this money to make you members of the booster club. You know wh- what he's trying to sell is buy in. He's I'm getting my kids to buy in, but. You know, those booster clubs are, are there to help provide scholarships and everything else. Well, they're out there playing for the university. I mean, ostensibly, you know, the ticket sales and whatever TV contracts for their conference they're in, everything else, the money they get for playing road games, those guarantee games as we call them, when teams like that play SEC or ACC or Big 12 schools and get their heads bashed in for a million-dollar check, uh, those are the guys who are, who are doing that. Um and that's and, and for a, a program like that, those guarantee games where they get their heads bashed in are what pays a lot of the bills for the whole department, not just for the for the football program. I mean, it's it just it, it, yeah, it was tone deaf beyond any level of tone deafness. And it, it's not only a matter of where he said, you know, I want you guys to be members. He actually phrased it before he was corrected by his compliance officer that he was saying it was a requirement. Um, Oh, sorry, coach. You can't require them to pay money for something when they're not even getting paid to be here. Uh, but yeah, it's it's just it, all it did was serve to remind the in- inequities in college athletics, uh, the, the relationship vis-a-vis coaches, the schools, and the athletes. And uh, you know, it's not going to mean anything because we're not going to get any closer to addressing those inequities. But it does remind us just how unbalanced the whole situation is. <laughs> But it was interesting because I was just sitting there, and sometimes when you read something, it just reads wrong, and it reads wrong in so many different directions, you're not sure which part really bothers you the most. Yeah. And that that's what that one was for me. I'm reading this, and I'm going, okay, this doesn't sound right. I don't understand, but like, where do I start on how it bothers me? Yeah. And I was sitting there in my mind again, I, I, I wish I could give credit to whoever wrote the comment about, hey, how about you just pay it for them? 
But the, the, you know, the first thought process was go, A, I, I remember it. And I, I, I'm a Dabo fan. No, no doubt about it. Love Dabo. And I remember Dabo, right after he first got the job at Clemson, was uh, under fire for trying to encourage his players to attend church. And he wasn't trying to say it was mandatory. He wasn't trying to get him to go to his church. He just was trying to get them to attend some form of a church service on Sunday. And it, it was funny. It was because, you know, the again, doing that in, in the proverbial Bible belt, it was something where, it's, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this. But I'm sitting there when, when the coach was talking about, hey, we're going to make this, we're going to make them do this. And I'm going... I don't you can do that. <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad somebody corrected it right away. And that one kind of falls back into the groups of people that we were talking about last week. Yeah. Yeah. You put a microphone in front of somebody, if they're not prepared, they're going to say something or do something that's, that's just going to make you scratch your head. And the next one I got for you, and this is a, this is a two or three part one, if you will. And again, we're talking about uh, Team USA from a basketball standpoint. Uh-huh. Now, two more people, for two different reasons, have dropped off the team. So now you have 13 people competing for 12 spots. Uh-huh. And, I, Chris, that sticks out to me for a couple of reasons. One, I hate the fact that one person is going to get cut. At this stage, yeah. But, <laughs> yeah, but now think about it again this this goes back to the Carmelo argument about why couldn't you let him come and practice and be a body now I know it's different with the World Cup versus the Olympics but Chris we need to take a second and let's fix this one obviously people do line up because they want to play in the Olympics and they want to go the extra the extra length they they're willing to do it I've always felt that you were kind of reaching to put together a World Cup team and ask for that level of a commitment from people. Again, they, they started out in Vegas, they went to L.A., and now they're, now they're overseas. How do we fix this? How, how do we, what do we do here? And do you turn the World Cup teams back to college players? How do you, what's realistic to expect in this situation? So put your commissioner hat on for a second and tell me how Chris Graham fixes this. You know, I fix it by saying I'm not sure if anything's broken. I mean, the guys who are there want to be there. And I want guys there who want to be there. And, you know, there's there's no way to, I mean, the only way to fix it would be for FIBA to say we don't have World Cups. Uh, because... Uh, you know, it, the hard part is here. It's not just the NBA. NBA is clearly um, it's the, the equivalent of of the European top soccer leagues uh, having to loan out their players for world for their World Cup, which is every four years, um, and, and they stop their season for it. I mean, basketball is it, 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 the worldwide game is, is so profitable that the seasons go on for much longer than soccer seasons do, and. Um, you know, so in, I, I'll use the NBA because we know it so well. You know, this World Cup starts around September 1st. NBA camps are going back, uh, the teams are going back to camp around September 20th. So, you know, and, and this, this uh, World Cup uh, situation for the United States, I mean, it's been ongoing for a few weeks now. So you're asking guys to give up. You know, whether your season ended in April uh, or May or June, depending on playoff situations, you know, you've got a few months off to R and R, and then when you go back September 20th, it's September 20th to April. Uh, not, it's not a job like regular folks work, where we live at home and and we work Monday through Friday, maybe or whatever the case may be. And we get to have weekends off and everything else. I mean, when you're a pro athlete, you're a pro athlete seven days a week for the duration of your season, for camp and duration of your season. With that one little break, the All Star break, three days if you don't make the All Star team, and so it's a grind. And so when they get that time off in the summer, I mean they're not just lounging around eating and getting fat; they're still working out and staying in shape. But they're they're also you know resting their bodies from the travel standpoint, and everything else. And so 
you know, to 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 say, okay, we're going to have camp for a, a World Cup uh, roster selection process starting in mid-July, and then you're going to work for a month, and then we're going to make a team and travel to Australia, and travel to China, and then you're going to get back from China, and then you go right back into the ground of your season. You're starting your season two months early at that stage. I don't know that there's anything you can fix there, because if you want to be competitive in a World Cup, you don't just – I mean, I know we have great competitive athletes, but you don't just – roll the ball out there, show up in China on September 1st uh, with a bunch of players and hope that that works. You, you do have to have some cohesion, some some systems, some plays, everything else. And so I say I say it again. I, I don't think it's broke. I mean, the guys who are there want to be there. Uh, I think that, you know, you go with what you got. Uh, I don't know you go back to college players because the college players have would have the same issue in one sense uh, that the pro players would. I mean, they, they have long seasons. They have – at least on paper, academic responsibilities. Summertime is a big time of for college athletes to 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 take extra you know classes. They take a lot of summer classes so that they can you know take it a little easier in the it, for for college basketball. It's a two semester sport. Football at least you can load up in the spring and summer, uh, and then t- take a limited workload in the fall. Basketball practice starts October first or so. Season starts around November first these days. Uh, if you're lucky, you're playing all the way into April. So uh, the summer is an important time for those young men too. Uh, and so I don't know that you fix it by just you know going that route. Or there was a time I want to say a few years ago we we went the route of having like G League players uh, and and, and kind of have a standing team with that. Um, I don't know that that does it any better. I mean those guys are hungry and that kind of thing, but they're maybe not as talented. This roster's talented. It's not going to be the most talented though. I, I read an analysis of this in the Athletic today. Uh, we might be the third or fourth most talented roster uh, going into this World Cup. So this team's going to have to work hard to win some games. Uh, but it's an opportunity for the Joe Harrises of the world to uh, to show and uh, you know show what they could do on the international stage. I just I don't know that it's broken, Jerry. I think I think you know you, you, the guys are there who want to be there, and let's let's give them a chance to play and win some games for us. Interesting because I, I want to revert back to a point you were making a couple of weeks ago. We were talking about the BBL, and you were talking about uh, you know Stanton Braves basically finishing out a season with not enough players on the roster to where they're having people play out of position. I, I just re- seem to remember that it was with a lot of fierce competition for these spots. That it was something that everybody wanted to do, and it was. When when cut and he came around, you're sitting there going, "Wow, I wonder if my guys are cut." Do you, Joe Harris has any? Is Joe Harris going to survive the cut? Is uh, there's a couple of Dukies in the mix, uh, one of the Plumley brothers and Jason Tate. It was a situation to where I'm I'm happy that uh, Plumley is going to get an opportunity, assuming he's not the one player cut. I just was surprised that I feel like we're flirting with not having enough players. And I mean, in, in theory, now that we have the, the what do we call it, the sister team, the backup team, if you will. Yeah. But you know, it, it's something to where, I, I, in my mind, if you if you go through the time to do the uh, the world stuff, it should matter when it comes to decide who's playing on the Olympic team. It, you know, it, it, that's just, it's just my thought. If you, but if you. The problem is if you do that, again, you're asking these athletes, and there was a requirement, you know, when we had that issue, 2004 team, uh, uh, you know, the, that, that, that horrible that horrible experience we had there, you know, yeah, they, they did, you know, take it more seriously for a few years and, and built back up and got those, you know, top players back involved. I just don't know. This World Cup thing, maybe, maybe it's the event itself. I mean, FIBA's trying to make money. I understand. Everybody's trying to make money. But it's not the Olympics. And, and I wouldn't want to predicate, you know, the Olympics. Because I'll be honest with you, Jerry. I don't know at this stage that you you would get the LeBron Jameses and and uh, James Hardens, et cetera, out for the World Cup. And if you said you can't play in the Olympics if you don't play in the World Cup, that just hamstrings you for the Olympics. Um, we get ourselves ready for the big stuff. And, and, you know, I don't know that anybody even – We'll we'll watch. We're we're hardcore basketball guys, like you said. There's Duke guys, there's UVA guys involved. If Joe Harris is on the court, I don't care what time of night it is uh, that you that, that the U.S. is playing Lithuania. I'm watching that game because I want to see Joe Harris play. You're watching Jason Tatum and and, and Plumlee. 
Um, there are other fans out there who will watch their guys, but I don't know that the average fan gives one iota of crap about the World Cup. Now, the Olympics, you know, yeah, 2020 Olympics, and we're out there. We want to win gold. We, we want to win We want to win everything. But the World Cup is just – it doesn't feel like it's the kind of thing that, you know, that the average fan cares about. FIBA's making money. You know, I'll, I'll say this. It's, it's, it's in China. I love the fact that it's in China. I want to see basketball grow in China for – for sports reasons and also for geopolitical reasons. I think that the more the West can interact with China, the better for the world. If we can all just learn that we're people instead of rivals on everything, maybe we can be better, you know, a better world. But, uh, but outside of the geopolitical and sports growth aspects to this, the World Cup itself is meaningless. If we, if we finish fourth place in this thing, it's not going to be any skin off our nose because we know next year we'll field the best team and we'll go in as the, as, as the heavyweight. And if we don't win the gold next year, then heads will roll. But uh, this year, the World Cup, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know that I'm going to be too upset if, if, uh, if, if we don't come out with a gold medal. Well, it's kind of funny because you're actually doing a great job of making – my point, which is the question of now other sports, I understand what the World Cup means. I do. I, I get what it means to the soccer world. I, I get what it means in, in other events. I just don't know that it isn't, I want to say a deterrent from the Olympic Games, but I just don't think that in the, in the basketball scheme of things, it, it, it has the same um, uh, the same amount of importance, yeah. Yeah. you know, from, from that standpoint. So that's what you know. That's kind of what's worrying me there. But on the we had a name pop up just this week, and it, it's just one of the most odd uh, careers I can remember. And I don't have a vested interest one way or the other. But uh, I wanted to get your take on Dwight Howard being in the news again. Uh, this young man, obviously got a boatload of talent and it always seemed like that something was amiss and they got him out of Washington. He played nine games last year. Uh, Memphis technically uh, have his rights now. They don't, they don't really want him. And now we hear with Boogie out, the Lakers are trying to work something out. So with a game of word association, somebody says Dwight Howard to you, what pops, what pops in your mind? Uh, he he's his skill set in 2019 doesn't fit the 2019 game. He, if he if if he's playing in the 1990s, he's one of the two or three biggest guys in the NBA uh, because the way the but the way the game is played now, a seven foot center who's got range to about five feet, who who needs the ball fed to him in post ups. Uh, and is a rim protector and big rebounder. That's just not the way the game is played anymore. You know the we we and I say we collective we uh, in the 80s. You know with with the the introduction of European styles of basketball. You know when when more NBA teams started drafting uh, European players and and all of a sudden you know the influx of European talent came to the league. Uh, you know, the game started playing differently. You know, the internationalization of our NBA game. Uh, you, you think back to who the who the you know the dominant players of the 80s and 90s were. The guys like Ralph Sampson and Patrick Ewing and Akeem Olajuwon, uh, Shaquille O'Neal, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Uh, you know, your the way the game was played was you had a every team who was who wanted to have a chance to win a championship had a big guy in the middle, a seven footer or something like that. Um, and you fed him the ball. The game was slower. Um, you fed him the ball, uh, and, and then he shot 60% from the field on little hook shots and drop steps and dunks, uh, and uh, and that's how the game was played. And uh, and you needed to be able to defend that guy too. So you know you so it was a premium on finding big guys with talent, both who could score and play defense. Dwight Howard can do both those things. You know he's 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 got he's got the skill set on both those sides to be the classic five, but. With the Europeanization of the game, uh, Dirk Nowitzki is a great example. You know, he's a seven-footer, and when he first came into the league, I remember thinking, why is this seven-foot guy shooting threes? You know, and then Kevin Durant, seven-foot guy who shoots threes, and it has the skills of a two-guard. Uh, you know, that's the way seven-footers play now. 
and and so you know Howard is outmoded at this stage, and so if you have him on your roster, you have to. It, it's kind of like you know, think about a football uh, you know, situation where you talk about a quarterback like a Robert Griffin III or a Colin Kaepernick, uh, where a running quarterback. Uh, teams are loath to have, or Lamar Jackson with the Ravens now. Teams are loath to go with the running quarterback because uh, you have to change everything to accommodate that guy's skill set, and you don't have a backup. What if that guy gets hurt? Uh, if you do everything to accommodate fitting Dwight Howard into your system. Uh, you've got to do everything so differently that it's just not worth it. And I think what happens is you look at him and you say, man, look at a physical specimen like that. And look at him. Nobody can guard him in the post. And then you start playing games and you realize, well, well, nobody plays that way. We can't win that way. He's really good at what he does, but we can't win that way. And so, poor guy. I mean, again, if he was, if he was in the 1990s, he'd be a perennial all-star. But in 2019, he just doesn't fit basketball anymore. So I feel awful for him. He's not doing anything wrong. He just he just doesn't fit basketball anymore. But in that uh, in that thought, and that was a, that was an awesome breakdown of that. Uh, in that thought, if he does end up with the Lakers, <laughs> you see him uh, having any kind of substantial role out there. His role will be uh, he, he will he will be the scapegoat for when things go wrong <laughs> because they're going to need that <laughs> um, you know because I don't I still don't see what they've done roster wise I mean you know with 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 LeBron and Anthony Davis uh, I'm already worried you know because I I said last our last podcast on Friday. Uh, I, I root for LeBron, the social activist and businessman. I don't necessarily root for LeBron, the, the basketball player. I, I, I actually, I, I, I overstated that. I do root a bit for LeBron, the basketball player. I just don't know. And so I, I, I watch the Lakers with great interest. I just like I watch the Cavaliers and Heat with great interest to see how they build around that generational talent. And I still don't see that they've done it right. I, I really think that pairing him up with Anthony Davis, all that's going to do is diminish Anthony Davis. Uh, there's not enough basketballs for both LeBron and Anthony Davis to play together. Um, if if uh, Dwight Howard can be sublimated well within a system, if all he if, if all you tell him to do, and 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 this is important because you tell him to do one thing and then him accepting the role is another thing, and I think that's been a problem for him at his several most recent stops, is he still thinks of himself as Patrick Ewing, you know, not you know, he doesn't think of himself as Patrick, but you know, a guy like that who can be. If you feed me, I'll score. Tw I'll give you 20 and 10 every night if you just play me right. Uh, he's not a 20 and 10 guy for the Lakers. He's not a 20 and 10 guy really for anybody that's going to be a playoff caliber team. If if what you tell him is set screens, rebound, play defense, and if he can accept that role, he can be a valuable guy for you. But the problem has been he has not accepted. He, he's 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 Always, you know, he's been mercurial in the sense that he 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 maybe comes in and says the right things when he when he joins a new team, but as soon as he realizes, you know what, here we go again. They're not gonna they're not gonna use me right. Uh, he becomes a bit of a locker room issue, and uh, so that's I, I kind of see that playing playing out for him. Unfortunately, I just you know he's a proud man it seems and uh, not able to accept that. He's not being used the way he thinks he should be used, but I don't see the Lakers. I mean, I really just don't see why the Lakers should flirt with this at all. Um, I would, I would rather find. Hey, let's find a Plumlee who who would accept being a guy rebounding, setting screens, and playing defense. You know, and I say that endearingly. You, you, not everybody can be a. Not everybody can be the, the the stud star who scores 20 and rebounds 10. Sometimes you you, you need guys who are talented. Uh, Draymond Green, I think, fits this role. He, he has fit that role so well with Golden State. Uh, you know, I don't need to score 30 every night. Um, I need to do the glue things. Everybody needs a glue guy. I don't see Dwight Howard accepting being the glue guy, and that's what the Lakers would need him to be. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I from a demeanor standpoint, and and again, uh, you know, all the way back to when the Superman banner was hung there on Dwight Howard, I feel like it. That, that almost every locker room he's been in, to some degree, whether justified or not, that he's been on the wrong end of all of the conversations. And I 
again, I don't know him. I've never spent any time with him. So when you're sitting there and when you, you meet the line the other day, we were talking about Urban Meyer, when you said, hey, no, I'm sorry, uh, actually it was uh, Harbaugh that was saying it. When there's that much smoke, there's got to be a fire. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, which, which on that, on that note, we're going to, we're going to switch up for a second on that, on that very note, because the guy that, Chris, I think his name's popping up in the wrong place too many times. What's your take right now on Ezekiel Elliott as uh, both a football player and an off-field personality? Uh, the off-field off worries me. He, you know, he, he, it's not that he gets in bad trouble like he does bad things. He, he, you know, it's just that he does so many silly things <laughs> off the field that, um, that it, it's, you, you know, the minor distractions can kind of add up. And I, from the standpoint of him holding out for more money and Melvin Gordon doing the same thing with the L.A. Chargers, running backs need to get paid early because running backs take abuse. Even though in the NFL now it's a passing game and, you know, uh, you know, the writing is on the wall as far as that goes. If you're an elite running back, you're still very valued. But also, I mean, you're getting hit all the time in ways that the body just is not b built to withstand for a long period of time. Todd Gurley, God forbid. I mean, look at that guy. He's he's a he's a generational talent, and he might already be done. You know, I, I know that the Rams are, are trying everything they can to extend his, his shelf life, but – I worry that we may have already seen the best of Todd Gurley, and it wasn't a very long period of time. Uh, and so in the NFL, you know, if, if you're a running back, you know, th I think that this is something, and it probably won't be addressed this way, but I'm thinking as the NFL and NFLPA work on their collective bargaining agreement renegotiations coming up in the next couple of years, if I were the NFLPA, one thing I would do, my, my running back constituency group within the NFLPA, here's what I would push for. You know, the, the, the uh, standard right now is a five-year rookie contract, uh, and that, that gives the team the control over you for five years. And so uh, I would I would actually maybe work in a system where running backs may be only a th two- or three-year full control for the teams because what happens is the shelf life for, for a running back is so much shorter than for other positions. Those elite guys only have a very limited window before all those hits on their legs start accumulating and, and their knees start going away from them, their ankles and, and their Achilles and everything else start start wearing down. And so uh, I'm all for Ezekiel Elliott. I'm all for Melvin Gordon. I, for Le'Veon Bell, you know, he, he got his big contract. Uh, we'll see if he lives up to any of it. But, no, I you know, running backs, uh, I, I feel like, should be a protected class within the, the contract status kind of thing. And so I'm all for Ezekiel Elliott holding out for as much money as he can get because, you know, he, he's he's sublime right now, but he's one hit on the knee away from from not lasting very long. And, you know, you think about guys in NFL history who, who have been the, the top running backs. You know, Barry Sanders walked away. Tiki Barber walked away. And and they they you know they they can still they can still you know play with their kids they can still do things. I look at Earl Campbell and I was a huge Houston Oilers fan when I was growing up. I have an aunt and uncle who live in Houston. They sent me when I was a kid one of my birthday presents was an Earl Campbell jersey. Back when people didn't wear jerseys, I was in like second grade and I took it to show and tell. I had a Houston Oilers helmet and an Earl Campbell jersey and they was those were my favorite. Those were my most memorable gifts as a kid. And um, Earl Campbell can't. He could hardly walk now. The Texas Rose, he, he, you couldn't tackle him, and he can't walk now. And so those guys take such abuse, they should get paid. Yeah, I really like the idea of, of changing the, the five-year uh, rookie contract, if you will, in regards to the, the running back position because you know, everybody talks about the health. Uh, and the longevity of the quarterback, but I love the quote. Uh, you know, I think McCowan was the one that signed with the Eagles this week, and they asked uh, Coach, uh, what, "What's your favorite thing about him?" And he goes, "Oh, we're closely close to being the same age." <laughs> so you got, and, and you got, uh, you know, Brady playing. That. I, I, I think that Brady's a freak from that point. But you're right; you don't see running backs playing in their late thirties. In their early 40s, right. it's a situation where, and I think you might be right about Gurley, and that, that would be a that would be a crying shame if that if that is the case. And, you know, when Elliot 
the first thing that he did, again, as far as the talent goes, that's insane talent, but you know, when, he, when the Cowboys made their first trip to Seattle, again, you know, my, my home state, it's legal to go into a store and buy marijuana. Uh-huh. And Ezekiel Elliott had never, never been around that. And, and what he did was he just went into a store and he, he just wanted to see it. And he didn't buy anything. He wasn't doing anything illegal. But there's a story about it. And, it, and it's about, okay, well, you know, he wasn't punished, but they're like, you just got to be smarter. You got to be smarter with your decisions. And this, this latest one, the incident with the Las Vegas security guard, uh, you know, I, I didn't want to, to buy into it until I heard, Chris, some of what the guy was supposedly demanding from Ezekiel Elliott. And he wanted a public apology, apology, X number of signed jerseys, tickets to Cowboy games, a check written to, uh, I believe it was a college football team, in addition to half a million dollars. I believe those, you know, and sitting there, and then you always remember that there's two sides to every story. I just feel like where Elliot's concerned, He's had four or five of those stories, and I'm hoping that he'll find a way to let the conversation be about his talent on a football field because out there, it's pretty, uh, he's a pretty special fellow. Yeah, just because you're just because you're an NFL athlete, elite athlete with millions of dollars at your disposal, doesn't mean you have to be a knucklehead about it. Uh, and, and and there are there are smart things to do. You don't need to go out every night. I mean, I'm not saying don't go out, but. You don't have to. Nobody's requiring you to. You can get some sleep. Uh, you can rest your body. You can get ready to do your job. Uh, he, he's going to. Uh, we, I mean, Dallas Cowboy fans, definitely hope he's going to play football this year. Uh, so yeah, yeah. But you know, the, uh, he's one of those guys uh, who likes to have fun, and that's fine. Uh, he's not Johnny Menzel, thank God for him. Uh, at least it doesn't seem. You know, we haven't seen that yet out of him, but. Uh, Manziel is such a sad case. Uh, you know, to see a talent like that just completely wasted away. But, um, but you know, yeah, I, 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 yes, it, I, we were in our 20s once too. Uh, but yeah, you know, you you don't have to put yourself in these positions to let people basically extort you the way he he he, he lends himself to those kind of situations. Unfortunately, sometimes. Uh, got to got to get you to put your media cap on for a second. And you can answer this with a yes or no, or you can actually elaborate. The thing I'm noticing in my mind more and more about the golf world is the amount of coverage that is being focused on Tiger Woods. Uh-huh. And there was a time where Chris Tiger Woods took the took the golf game to a whole nother level. He really did. I, I remember, and he was my favorite same high school for years and years and years. Loved Curtis Strange, everything about him. Knew where his house was over in Williamsburg, and it was a situation where Curtis Strange was the first person, okay, Chris, to make a million dollars in a season. He was the one that broke that barrier. And now, thanks in a large part, Tiger Woods, people are making that in a weekend. Yeah. Well, I'm not. I'm not questioning what he did for the game. I, I'm not sure that it's not too much right now um, as far as you know, like, uh, the fees I get. Before I hear who wins the tournament, I get a full breakdown of what Tiger did in the tournament. Uh-huh. But from a media standpoint, do you feel he still warrants being placed in a manner where it's almost as if he's above the game? Yeah, the ratings suggest that. The ratings for the Masters were, were solid this year. They were much better than the last few years. Uh, when Tiger's in contention, uh, people are watching. Uh, he, he is the guy. There are only a few guys like this, a few people like this across the sports spectrum that if if they're involved, the casual fan is, watches. And I, I'll, I'll admit to being one of those people. I, I don't watch golf uh, on a regular basis, but if – I hear that Tiger is uh, at a major event uh, with a chance to win. Uh, I will uh, the, maybe the only six hours of golf I watched this year were Sunday at the Masters, and I started watching at nine o'clock that morning. They had to play early because of the weather, uh, 
And so, you know, if that's the case, that's if that's what's good for business. And uh, I think golf's bigger issue is that it has not produced another person with that kind of appeal. You know, Jack Nicklaus and Arnold Palmer for the longest time, uh, no matter what happened with them. I mean, when Jack won the Masters, I think it was 86 when he was 46 years old, you know, had that last that that 18th major. Uh, that came out of nowhere. Uh, but even for many years afterwards, I mean, 86, you know, when he went to the senior tour and he, he would, when he would tee it up occasionally on the PGA main tour, I mean, people would still care about what Jack did. And, you know, then the mantle sort of got passed and because Tiger debuted, I think, and he was, he was on the main stage in 94 and 95 when he won the U S amateur back to back debuts in 96, wins the masters in 97 with that, that, that huge 12 shot victory. And, you know, has that sustained run for about a decade or so, uh, you know. But since then, we've had a few guys who play great golf, but nobody who steps up and and says, "I'm the guy that this whole thing runs around." And uh, and so that's the bigger problem is that golf has not figured out, and, and I don't think you figured out. That's I guess I, I should say it that way. Um, it's not like it's not like in act in, in in the world of movies or in the world of pro wrestling, which I'm so familiar with, where you build a star, and then you make that star, and then you build around that star. Uh, Tiger came out of T- Tiger, you know, made himself. Jack Nicholas made himself. Arnold Palmer made himself. Uh, Richard Petty in NASCAR made himself. You know, the Mickey Mantles and Babe Ruths, and you know, those kind of guys make themselves. And there's nobody there in golf that makes you say. Pay attention to this golf tournament. Tiger Woods still can do that, and so the PGA Tour needs to ride that as long as they can because you know the the million dollar weekends go away once Tiger Woods is is irrelevant in golf. Well, it's kind of funny because my question involved in that is isn't in in my mind is part of it because how much money you can make now. Other words, you don't. I mean, you see guys between golfing commercials or titleist commercials or various things, but they're not out there having to sell themselves because you can be a good golfer and make ten million dollars in a season. I, I don't know if the two are tied. You're absolutely correct. There is no personality out there. There is nobody. Who's larger than life, and the only person they really in recent, you know, memory other than Tiger was, you know, maybe someone like Don Daly, somebody who demanded the camera, who, you know, he, he, there was a story there, there was a, there, you're following something there. I, I, I think now, and you could just say, hey, there's no personality out there, but I, I look at, you compare it to Ted, it was uh, Federer and uh, Nadal. Uh-huh. I know I'm missing one, uh, Djokovic. Djokovic, yeah. I don't think those guys are personalities. I think they're just damn good tennis players. <laughs> now, that's not to say that if you went to a bar, a party with Roger, you wouldn't have fun. But I, I and you do see them doing things like, uh, you know, Rolex commercials. And, and again, two different sports. But I, I just, in my mind, part of the the reason that. The, the, the no other golfer is coming out, if you will, and being the personality is, um, I don't think they have to. If, in, in, in my mind, you're going, okay, well, if I can make $10 million a year, and all I have to do is play golf and play in charity events, then, I don't know, it's a theory. But, so, the, the question is, we ride the Tiger Woods cow, or milk the cow as long as we can. Yeah, and I would clarify, I, I don't mean to say, because Tiger Woods is not a personality at all. His interviews are boring. He is the worst. He, he's an automaton when he's in front of a camera, which which in, in a way can be good because, you know, he doesn't often step into things like we, we've talked about so much the last few shows uh, where coaches or players or both will step into things because they don't know how to, you know, talk to a reporter. But it's not about the personality it's about, and that's why I say you can't make a star. A star just happens, uh, you know, it, because of their greatness. When you mention the tennis guys, when you mention Federer and Nadal and, and Djokovic, it's because they're good, you know. And 
I don't care. I, 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 I've heard Roger Federer talk. Uh, Nadal can, you know, he speaks in broken English because you know Spanish is his, his native language. I don't care what they say, but man, when they're playing in Wimbledon, I'm watching. You know, and I'm not even again. I don't watch every tennis. I don't watch tennis tournaments regularly, but if I know that there's a major, especially a Wimbledon or a French Open or U.S. Open, which is coming up pretty soon, if 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 those guys are in a semifinal or final, I'm watching because I know it's going to be good. And so, uh, you know, that's the thing. Right now, the, the and, and lefty Phil Mickelson's the other guy right now of of and, and the the. The, the dichotomy between Woods and Mickelson. You know, Mickelson for the longest time was the best player to never win a major. He's finally won. He uh, finally won a few majors, but you know, uh, so you rooted for Lefty, uh, or you rooted for Tiger. Uh, you know, they were sort of the yin and the yang of golf for, for quite a long time. But again, they just made themselves because they were always in contention in the big tournaments. Uh, Tiger won them. Phil lost them for a long time, uh, but. Greatness decides itself in that sense. Um, I don't know that it needs to, because you know, think about Mickey Mantle. We only know now was a colorful guy. Back in the 50s and 60s, baseball sports wasn't covered to cover the personality. Um, we only knew it because of Jim Bouton's book Ball Four, what a personality Mickey Mantle was, and we found out after the fact, of course, what a personality he was. But he was great. Willie Mays was great. We didn't know a thing that Willie Mays had to say, but he was great. Uh, Barry Bonds, in his own way, uh, was was obviously a great player, you know. Um, and so we, we we look for greatness. We just look for transcendent guys or gals, and we and we we latch ourselves onto them. What I would say about the current crop of of top golfers is that. Um, no one has said, I'm going to be the next Tiger, the next Jack. Not said it, but shown it on the course. Nobody's ripped off four, four majors in a couple of years or five majors in three years or just won one thing over and over and over. Whereas those tennis guys you talked about, Nadal and Federer and Djokovic, they've each got, I mean, they're, they're, you know, you're talking about 15, 16, 18, 20 major, you know, majors that they've won. Uh, and so when you're always there, uh, now you root. I root. So I've got my favorite guy among those three. My favorite is Federer. You know, some people will say it's Nadal. Some will say it's Djokovic. But you got a favorite, and when they're playing, you root for that favorite. And so when you have a Tiger out there, you know, either you like Tiger or you like the field. You know, I don't know that anybody's out there saying, "Boy, I can't wait to see Brooks Kepka play golf." <laughs> No offense to Brooks Kepka, he's really good, but nobody's out there saying, "I can't wait." To, uh, gosh, he's going to be in my town. I want to go see Brooks Kepka. No. It's funny where Brooks is concerned because he has strung together a few, but it's kind of funny. One of my one of the funniest interviews, Chris, I've heard in a long time. And they were asking him, "What would you do to make the game better?" And I don't know if you ever saw any of their responses. He goes, yeah, first thing I'm doing is I'm short. It's just too long. He goes, I'm out there playing. It's 18 holes. He gets bored in the middle of it. He goes, hey, let's just make it nine holes. <laughs> and he's going through all of this process of, you know, yeah. trying, to put a, trying to put a spin on something. Trying to, you know, it'd be, in my mind, it'd be like, okay, well, we're going to skip innings one through six. We're just going to start in the seventh inning. But I, I do, he's the guy I kind of, I mean, Dustin Johnson, I believe it was yesterday, uh, finished with a 25 under, a convincing win. That was the second story on my golf beat. Right behind Tiger shot a 72 and didn't qualify for the championship. So, <laughs> it, it's interesting. I remember when it's heyday, and again, I had no problem with it when it was in its heyday, that there was a there, there was a day where the television coverage only showed the leap of the tournament three times. And the guy was joking about it. He goes, hey, we're all grateful to Tiger because we're making the money. He goes, but my mom called and said, were they in a rain? Why weren't you on TV? But so when the guy's winning the tournament, it's, it's interesting from, from that standpoint. And I also agree with you about the good interview. That's not, that's not Tiger's forte. No. But in the long run, that might help him. That might help him. Hey, I wanted to sneak in an ACC one real quick. Um, this guy here. For those, it might not be a household a household name, if you will, but the Tate Martell. Tate Martell, for those people out there listening, this young man, when he was a quarterback in high school in the state of Nevada, he was the can't miss of can't misses. Went to Ohio State, uh, 
could not break through all the talented quarterbacks there and ended up transferring to, to Miami. And most people thought that he was a shoe-in to be their starting quarterback this year at his second school. And I, I, I read a story the other day, and I'm not sure if it's going to stick or not, where lost a quarterback battle at Miami, and they were flirting with trying to see if he'd be willing to be a receiver. And I'm sitting here, and again, I, I've never been so good at something to where everybody in the country wanted me. I, I'm asking myself, for in this young man's shoes, and what's the old great line about quarterbacks? If you're playing two, you don't have one. At this point, does he think about going to a third school, or does he think about saying, okay, let me see if I can contribute from a different position? First thing I'll say about Tate Martell is Google Tate Martell's girlfriend. Um, and uh, – she, she, he, he outkicked the coverage. He overthrew his receiver by 20 yards. Uh, as far as, as far as the young lady who is, uh, who currently has his affections, I guess. Um, uh, no, as far as his football career, so I don't feel sorry for him. When you Google Tate Martell girlfriend, you will not feel sorry for this young man. He, um, he, as far as his football goes, uh, and I wonder, I, I actually thought about that when, when, when I saw Saw her and him together in the in the photos they posted on Instagram here recently. I thought, hmm, I wonder if she's if she realizes she's still with a, she's with a backup quarterback again. Uh, backup quarterbacks don't deserve girlfriends this good. Uh, so uh, so that said, uh, you know, it's hard because you know he lost out a job to a guy who's now in the NFL, a first round pick in the NFL. He transfers out because because. The number two overall recruit in the country transfers in from Georgia and is immediately eligible. So that sucks. I mean, there's, there's two things against him that have nothing to do with him that just happens that, boy, NFL first-round picks ahead of me, number two recruit in the country is ahead of me. Now I'm transferring to Miami, and I lost out to a guy who has two years in the system. So, I mean, I, that's an sort of an excuse that Nikosi Perry has two years in the system and so probably had a head start there. You know, if I'm better, I'm still better, but – um, if you transfer one more time, uh, you know, I mean, in, in the end, all that matters is that he gets to play and show his skill set, and he wants to play in the NFL, and, and, and everybody says he has NFL talent. But, you know, how many times do you get to transfer before people say the issue isn't them, it's you? Um, and uh, I, I wonder about that for the young man. I don't know if I want to play receiver, though. I mean, he's, he's a quarterback. Don't 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 change and become a receiver just because you lost out a couple of times. You know, I would say that we talked about this recently with Kelly Bryant at Clemson, who's now at Missouri. He lost the job to Trevor Lawrence. Lawrence is a generational talent, uh, and he took his ball and went home. And Clemson could have used him uh, in a game where they really needed they they really needed an experienced backup quarterback, and and held on by the skin of their teeth to beat Syracuse and go on the way to their national championship. Uh, you know, football is a game of injuries, next man up kind of thing. Uh, maybe Nikosi Perry isn't effective. I mean, I don't know if I give up if I'm him. Uh, and uh, so uh, I, I hope for his sake that he fights it out. Uh, you know, don't play receiver. If, if you decide – if anything, if you decide to do anything, I would transfer one more time. Uh, and uh, – but also uh, I would I – would, Say all the nice things, write poetry, uh, do whatever, make sure I buy enough chocolates to keep that young lady happy because there are worse things than, uh, than, than losing your football job. I, I can only imagine that half of our listeners right now are, have either already Googled her or uh, are, are getting ready to. So I'll have to, I'll have to do that myself when I get back to hear a computer here. So appreciate the insight there. Yeah, I got I know we're getting close to that time, and uh, I got a handful of big topics that'll that'll wait till Friday. But I, I got to share one with you. And, and again, one of the things that I think when I really share together uh, is how much we love John Calipari. And uh, yeah. my brother is out here uh, visiting. Uh, he, in fact, he got here last night, and uh, of course, he's the one that graduated from Louisville and. He's listened to all of my Calipari stuff for forever. 
But the funny story, um, I'm at a, a game, a baseball game in Lexington, Kentucky a couple years ago. And um, to see Tim Tebow play. And that night, that night, they're giving away Calipari bobbleheads at the Lexington Legends game. And I'm going, wow, this is just me thinking this out myself. I go, wow, you got the most Christian man. In the house. And then they were put on a baseball uniform. And you got the Antichrist bobblehead night. I go, I don't think this is going to play out well. <laughs> Thunderstorm. Biblical proportions roll through. The game gets rained out. The game gets rained out. The only thing that I walk out of the stadium with is a Kalapari bobblehead. <laughs> I go back to my brother and I said, here, you can have this. I, I just, I don't have room in my, in my life for this dude's bobblehead. So my brother does a lot of work uh, through his church, a lot of visitations, elderly in the hospital and because he's doing it in the Louisville area there's a decent number of Kentucky fans and it's funny it is that he shows up and he goes hey I got something for you and I uh, he goes I, I was visiting this this man that's battling cancer and he heard the story about the bobblehead and I traded the bobblehead for another bobblehead so as I'm sitting here now, Chris, I'm looking at a Tubby Smith bobblehead. Oh, yeah. And, wow, I feel like I won the lottery. <laughs> that's awesome. my, brother said, my brother said, that's funny. That guy felt like he won the lottery. <laughs> and he listens, my brother listens to my, my, you know, my, my noise, and he, he made the argument. Here's a guy in the hospital trying not to lose his life. And I said, I say it all the time. I said, Tubby Smith. Ten years, no violations, one national championship. Fired. Calipari, ten years, one national championship. Lifetime contract. And uh, I'll stand by that. And uh, I pull for Tubby, and I'm glad that he's still coaching. And it's a situation to where the guy answers back to my brother. He goes, yeah, but Tubby won his with somebody else this week. <laughs> oh. <laughs> And I'm sitting there in my mind going, poor Cubby Smith can't win ever. I I hated that they he got run out of Memphis before he could do what he came there to do because they heard Penny Hardaway was available. Yeah, yeah. I but agree. I'm now the proud owner of a Cubby Smith bobblehead, and that's uh to get to get that out of a Calipari bobblehead. I think that's a that's a pretty big win for me. Yeah, you 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 achieved there. I've only got one bobblehead, and I'll, I've never really been a bobblehead person. But uh, we bought tickets to uh, uh, the UVA night at uh, uh, Washington Nats Park. Uh, Arizona was in town actually that weekend. Uh, that was a weekend that I mean they, the National Basketball Championship trophy was there. I got my picture taken with that. But they also the next day, so it was actually the, the that was a Friday night game. The Saturday game uh, was uh, Sean Doolittle bobblehead day. And so Sean Doolittle play, uh, pitched at UVA, played first base at UVA, and uh, Crystal and I, my wife Crystal and I, actually sat behind home plate for one of his starts with about 50 scouts all pointing radar guns at him every time he, he did anything with his left arm. And uh, so it was when, I don't, again, I don't really care about bobbleheads generally, but that day, I think the game was a 2 o'clock game. I was in line at 1.15, to make sure I got my bobble, in fact, we got each got bobbleheads. I got one on my desk here where I do podcasts in my little podcast studio on our, on our second floor. I've got one on my desk uh, downstairs in our main office on the first floor. So, uh, so that's all. That, that, that's the only bobblehead I'll probably ever have. And it's actually, it's not just Sean Doolittle. He's a big Star Wars guy. Uh, it's it, it, he's dressed up as Obi Wan Kenobi, and the the uh, insignia on the bobblehead says Obi Sean Kenobi. So. I've got. A, I'm a Nats fan. I'm a UVA guy for life. I've got. I've, I've got a bobblehead of, of the uh, UVA alum, uh, dressed up as a Star Wars guy. That's that's about as special as it'll ever get. Well, there you go. And every every day before we get together and do one of these, I have two bobbleheads with an Augusta Free Press hat sitting in between them. <laughs> and on the left is Coach K, 
Uh-huh. And on the right is Cavman. Okay, so there you go. <laughs> I figured you got Coach. Now, I haven't found my one of Coach Coach Cup yet. He probably bumped Coach K off the uh, off the screen for me there. But Chris, I got a number of other great topics. I think we need to put him in a put a put a pin in it. We'll have some good stuff on Friday if we still get a chance to get back together. I've uh, always a pleasure, and I'm already looking forward to the next one. Yes, that's right. For our listeners out there, thank you for joining us. And Jerry and I will get back with you on Friday. Thanks for listening.